The majority of Paul's letters to various churches were written to address problems in a particular church or group of churches. The book of Ephesians, like the book of Romans, was written more to explain some of the great themes and doctrines of Christianity. Chronologically, it was the last of Paul's letters to the churches, and as such it carries the ideas of the earlier letters forward to a new stage. Many scholars believe it is the most profound book Paul wrote. Indeed, the great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Whosoever would see Christianity in one treatise, let him read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the epistle to the Ephesians. Paul jumps into his theme by introducing the doctrine of divine election as early as the fourth verse. As the Living Bible words it, Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own, through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes, without a single fault. We who stand before him covered in his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. So what does it mean to be chosen by God? What are we chosen for? What is he looking for from us? There are four separate things that Paul records in the first chapter. We are chosen to be holy. As Christians, we're called to be separate from the world. We should not live a life like the world lives. We live according to God's word, a life that is blameless in the sight of other people, and most importantly, in God's sight. In order to be the men and women he wants us to be, we need to fully surrender ourselves to the craftsmanship of the master's hands. We are nothing but the material he uses. It is he who makes us into who he wants us to be. This is not accomplished by our will or effort, but only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. We are chosen to be his people, adopted through Jesus Christ. Being predestined means that God knew his plans long before you and I ever arrived on this planet. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God put the plan in place to redeem his lost world by sending his only son, born of a woman, to be the means of salvation for any person regardless of age, race or gender. As children of God, we have been born again of God into a spiritual life, no longer slaves to sin and death. We are sons and daughters of the Father who is in heaven, and anything we ask of him will be given to us. We are chosen according to his will. Peter wrote that God desires no one to perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. Therefore, as God's vessels, we should love and share Jesus with everyone we know. The only way to get God the Father is through genuine and earnest repentance. God has not, and does not, choose who makes it to heaven and those who inherit hell. It's a very real choice that each and every one of us makes. We choose his ways or our ways. If you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour, not only have you been chosen to be a child of God, but also you will receive God's inheritance because you have become his son or daughter. We are chosen to glorify God. God is glorified when we leave our sinful lives and turn to him for life. We are changed, others take notice, and God is glorified. Our new lives bring glory to God because his will is accomplished in our lives. When we put our hope in Jesus and not in ourselves, we will have victory over sin and death in our lives. Then we give all the praise and glory to God for changing us and rescuing us through Jesus. Before you drew your very first breath, God Almighty chose you. While you were still in your mother's womb, God said, I choose you. It was his love for you that brought him to earth. It was his love for you that led him to the cross. 
It was because he chose you that he died on the cross. He chose you to be with him for eternity. Twice in the first few verses of the second chapter, Paul tells us, It is by grace you have been saved. But this means little unless we understand what it is that we're saved from. Paul explains you were dead in your sins. Very often we belittle the seriousness of sin. It's not being naughty, it's not being sick. Paul says we were dead. We were dead in sin and still are unless we are saved. Dead. No life at all in us. That means that we acknowledge that the wages of sin is death. And also means that we take a deep look at self to see ourselves as we really are. My conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments. That's a tough thing to admit. We may even have lived our whole lives calling ourselves a Christian, but we're just going through the motions. Unless we know that we are sinful through and through, we cannot and will not experience the grace of God. We need to know that God made us alive in Christ. God raised us up in Christ. Without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction and righteousness and holiness of Christ, as if I'd never sinned or been a sinner. Christ died and paid the penalty of my sin that I might live. That is grace. But why should God do that for us, Paul tells us? Because of his great love for us. The result of this great act of grace gives us eternal life and a restored relationship with God. It means we are seated in the heavenly realms with Christ. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. But God wants us to know more and more how great, how incomparably rich his grace is towards us. Paul again reminds us that we're saved by grace, and he also tells us that we're saved through faith. All I need to do is to accept this gift with a believing heart. We're only saved when we trust that what God did in Christ is true and is necessary, when we rely on him rather than on ourselves, when we allow him to sit on the throne rather than ourselves. We need to give over control to God, but that is humanly impossible to do. It's natural to want to be in control, if not over others, at least over our own lives. Faith is not a natural thing. So even the faith that we have is a gift by God's grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even faith is not our own doing. We cannot believe unless God sends the Holy Spirit to us to give us a new heart. God's grace goes much further. We are God's workmanship created in Jesus Christ. When we were born again, we became God's workmanship. Not a poor copy or cheap reproduction, but an original by the master artist. What does that mean? Our character and attitudes are the work of God. Even our spiritual growth is by the grace of God. It is not who we are, but who is in us, at work in us. God enables us to serve him and to serve one another. Paul says we were created to do works God made us such that we can be useful tools to be used by him. Our gifts and abilities are by God's grace. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. Even the opportunities to serve God are given to us as part of his grace. Did you know that God has already prepared opportunities for you, for us, to do good works? 
God's grace is everything. We cannot boast in anything, in faith, in who we are, in our gifts, in our good works, in our blessings. God's grace is incomparable. In chapter 3, Paul introduces the greatest mystery in the universe, the mystery of Christ. Christ is God's greatest revelation of his plan for the universe. Through God's grace, he reconciles us to himself. He also reconciles us to his specially chosen people, the Jews. We now share citizenship with the Jews in God's kingdom. Now, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. It can seem such a a little mystery to us, but to the Jew, this is earth-shattering. The Jews were the chosen people, identified by God, proven by circumcision, empowered by God, a nation especially blessed, the apple of God's eye. And now these Gentile interlopers are part of the family. We, as Gentiles, are the outsiders, the sinners, the prodigals. We are ignorant of their traditions, the meanings of their rituals. The mystery of God's grace is that he has also chosen us, and chosen a moment to reveal the mystery of grace. It is indeed a mystery. In the mystery, God chooses mysteriously. God chooses those who ought not to be chosen. He chose Paul, who admits that he is the least of the least. Writing to Timothy, Paul said that Christ came to save sinners, of whom he is the worst. Paul was the persecutor of Christians. Surely he shouldn't be their spokesman and theologian, and yet he was. We ought not to be saved, and yet we are. God chooses and uses those we naturally would not choose. His grace to us is a mystery, even though we know that the mystery is his grace. The grace of God has a further purpose. It is to bring glory to God. God kept the revelation of this mystery back until the time that he had united Jews and Gentiles under his grace. Then he could declare his intent and unfolding plan of salvation in order that he would be glorified. It is clear that we are part of this great purpose because it is through the church that this is to be accomplished. God chooses you and me just as he chose Paul and Peter and the others. He has chosen weak men and women down the ages to fill with his mysterious grace and to fulfil his holy purposes. And this brings him the greatest glory. God has chosen the least likely, the least fit, the least skilful. Another mystery is that despite knowing the mystery, it is still a mystery how and why he does it. Back in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King delivered one of the most iconic speeches of all time. The theme was his dream, a vision for racial equality. Everyone has dreams. Some might be personal and unambitious. Others, like Dr. King, might be massive or global. The key is not having the dream. Anyone can have a dream. But do you have the courage to act on it? Paul wrote, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Whatever we may dream, God can still do more. If our dream does not stretch you to the point of discomfort, it's probably not from God. Dreams are a process. God will not lift you up out of your dream and set you down in the centre of its fulfilment. You will not be able to trust God for the fruition of your dream until you see his faithfulness in the process. Do not despise the process, for that is where we learn to trust God. When we are led by him, there are no signposts. 
At times your heart is breaking with a pain that's so intense. And all you hold are broken pieces to a life that makes no sense. He wants to lift you up and hold you. Mend each torn event. If he can paint a sunset and put the stars in place. If he can raise mountains and calm the storm-tossed seas. If he can conquer death forever to open heaven's gates, then surely he can find a way. Your dream will never progress unless it is pursued. We must pursue the dream God has given you, no matter how far-fetched it may seem. Your dreams are the joy of your present and the hope of your future. Protect them, feed them, encourage them to grow. We are not the only dreamers. God has a dream for you. And as you seek him, he will reveal it to you. When he reveals his dream for you, you must remember that dreams are specific, not general. Personal, not public. God will not give someone else your dream. He'll give it to you. Dreams are usually outside the realm of the expected. With God, all things are possible. Dreamers are risk takers and are always in the minority. Those who walk by sight will always outnumber those who walk by faith. Remember Paul said, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God is able because of his person as creator. He is able because of his power. Two of the gospel writers tell us that with God all things are possible. There are no limits with God. He can do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Clearly, abundant indicates a huge, possibly never-ending amount. But Paul tells us that God's abilities exceed that. This is to an extraordinary degree, involving a considerable excess over what would be ex expected. He is able to do all that we ask. But more than that, he's able to do all that we ask or think but more than that, he's able to do above all that we ask or think. But even more than that, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God's ability through us is conditioned on the power that works within us. Paul says, out of his glorious unlimited resources... He will give you the mighty inner strengthening of his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down to the soil of God's marvellous love. And may you be able to feel and understand, as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep and how high his love really is and to experience this love for yourselves. And so at last you will be filled up with God himself. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? The, the authorised King James Version says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The NIV says so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. But here we have Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts. Paul then says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner appropriate to the calling to which you have been called. Paul chooses his words carefully. He says, I urge you. He doesn't play the apostle card and say, you must do this or I'm making you. No, he urges. He's encouraging. He's pleading. He also carefully says to walk in a manner worthy or appropriate to your calling. He doesn't say justify your calling or prove it or earn it, but live in response to what Christ has already done for you. Paul encourages us to live in the calling that we have received. 
He wants us to walk in a way that is appropriate to it. The Apostle encourages us to conduct our lives as people saved by Jesus Christ. We don't have to earn or justify this calling. We don't have to prove it. We just live it. The Apostle then naturally moves to some of the virtues to guide our walk in this calling. He encourages us to live our lives with all humility. In Paul's day, humility was a despised virtue and characteristic. It was seen as weak, servile, ignoble quality. People look down on those who are humble. It's not too different today as our society exalts the self. It's all about me. It says put yourself first, look out for number one. It's hard to be humble when you live in, breathe, come into contact with this sort of thinking constantly. Humility places a greater value on others than oneself. It sees others as greater, more important. It puts them first. Humility is never below serving. And Paul pairs this with his second virtue, gentleness. Gentleness is loving submissiveness. It's a patient leading to others, even when provoked. It's a willingness to serve and share rather than to demand. It's the opposite of self-assertive rudeness. It is, if you like, humility in action. Paul then moves to patience. The Greeks have a helpful word picture for the word patience. They use the word macrothumia. It comes from two words, macro, which means long or big, and thumia, where we get our word thermos, thermometer or thermostat from, meaning heat. So put it all together, you get long heat or big heat. To be patient, you have to be long on the heat. It's like having a long fuse. It's also worth mentioning that this is the word that describes God's patience towards sinful humanity. The Apostle encourages us to be patient. Next, Paul says, bear with one another in love. In any relationship, people will upset you, hurt you, annoy you. When that happens, bear with them in love, even when they don't deserve it. We must strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Peace ties us to God, and it ties us to one another. As we look at our walk, we see that we don't walk appropriate to our Christian faith. We don't embody these virtues and practices like we should. Fortunately, they are the qualities of the one who called us. He is humble, patient, gentle, loving and peaceful towards us. Our Lord helps us to do the walk that he has called us to. Paul moves to talk about the unity of our calling. What do we have unity in? Paul says there is one body, there is one church, which is our Lord's body. It's rooted and grounded in him. There is one spirit, and he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies us. There is one spirit that we have access to God in. There is one spirit given in baptism. He is indivisible and unites us all. There is one hope that belongs to our call. This is a present hope, not just a future one. It is the hope that we are forgiven in Jesus Christ and have eternal life in him. The Apostle proclaims that there is one Lord Jesus to whom every knee will one day bow. Paul also says there is one faith, not multiple versions of it. The Apostle says there is one baptism. We are reborn and made anew in baptism. As the Creed says, one baptism for the remission of sins. And Paul finishes it by saying there's one God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. We have one God and Father because of Christ. Only in him can we acknowledge and call God Father. It is these things that we have unity in. This is the unity of our calling and it comes from Christ. Paul finishes it up by telling us about the gifts of our calling. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. As members of Christ's body, the church, God has given us all gifts and talents to use so that we can serve him and others in it. He equips us and gives gifts to those whom he has called. Chapter 5 begins with a seemingly impossible challenge. Be imitators of God. How hard is it to be an imitator of God? Our text tells us some of the things that we need to rid our lives of. It also tells us that if we don't eliminate those things, we have no inheritance in the kingdom. Then it warns about being deceived by empty words. God knew that some Christians would be deceived. Paul had written to the Corinthian church, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Ignoring the truth of God's word by refusing to preach it is dangerous. We need to remember God's words as recorded by the prophet Isaiah. These people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Paul says that God calls people like this disobedient, and disobedience leads to death. Also, it leads to God's wrath. Therefore, we are told not to do these things, but also not to fellowship with those who do such things. Paul regularly contrasts the before and after of the Christian life. He does it several times in his own testimony, and he frequently does it for his readers. Rather than just declaring that we live in the light, he begins with the statement of contrast. For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Live as children of light in all goodness, righteousness and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Paul says that we are in the light, so live like it. Goodness, righteousness and truth. Don't close your eyes to the truth. Don't think that you can do what your flesh wants and you'll still be okay with God. Paul adds, find out what pleases the Lord. Paul actually starts by listing some things that do not please the Lord, living in darkness, acting in shame, living in an unwise manner and being drunk. The things that please God, in this passage at least, are being filled with the Spirit. In the original text it's an interesting word, as it appears in the present continuous tense. So a better translation would be, be filled and keep on getting filled with the Spirit. This is not one momentous event, but a constant, ongoing lifestyle. Sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, ensuring our worship comes from the heart rather than just from the mouth. Live in an attitude of constant thanksgiving to God. Humbly submit to one another out of reverence for our Lord and Saviour. Of course, in his other letters, Paul lists many more ways to please God, including maintaining good relationships, particularly within the home, a good prayer life, doing good, sharing with others, being controlled by the Spirit day by day, bearing fruit in our lives, including the fruit of the Spirit, having faith, obeying God, and many more things. Paul then expands on the idea of laying the right foundation to have a blessed family life. Many Christians today have a plaque somewhere in their home which begins, Christ is the head of this home. It sounds nice, it even sounds right, 
but actually it's unbiblical. Paul tells the Ephesians that the husband is the head of the home. Now, I know that is unpopular nowadays, but the role is not one that anyone else should covet, because it's not a head in terms of authority, but in terms of workload and responsibility. The husband needs to set the spiritual temperature in the family. He must direct the spiritual course of the home through teaching, prayer and example. He must graciously love his wife and children in spite of their weaknesses because that's how Christ loves his bride, the church. Similarly, the family is blessed when the wife is a woman of prayer, of caring and of character. One who is always available and willing to be submissive. The prayers and character of a wife will carry their husband and children through difficult times. Such a wife will create a culture of beauty within the home. Children brought up in the fear of the Lord will be blessed by the Lord, and they will be a blessing to their parents in return. They should also learn to serve God from a young age. As we guide our children in the ways of the Lord, we need never fear for their future, because they are blessed. We should remember that Paul had said earlier in his letter that the church is God's family. Being a part of it and serving God together through your home church will bring blessing to the family. Joshua's words still ring true today, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Bring added blessing to your family by making your home an extension of the ministry of your church. Your home can be used for God's purposes, through maybe a small group or a prayer group. It could also be a place where people can seek spiritual counsel. A survey of children was conducted a few years ago, which indicated the most appreciated qualities for dads. The top three were, he takes time for me, he listens to me, and he invites me to go places with him. Notice that each one of those involves time. Children need time. We devote time and energy to the people and things we value the most. Children conclude that if you don't have time for me, then you must not care about me. One anonymous father wrote, A hundred years from now it will not matter what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or the kind of car I drove. But the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. No amount of success can compensate for failure in the home. We need to listen more. We need to be approachable. We need to hear the things that are important to our children. Our lifestyle is the lesson. Paul tells us dads to bring up our children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Spiritual guidance cannot be delegated to others. Sunday school teachers aren't the ones entrusted with the responsibility of making disciples of our children. A child's relationship with God begins in the home. If our faith in Christ is genuine, it will be seen at work in our homes. General Douglas MacArthur, an army general in the Second World War, said, By profession I am a soldier and take great pride in that fact. But I am prouder, infinitely prouder, to be a father. A soldier destroys in order to build. The father only builds, never destroys. It is my hope that my son, when I am gone, will remember me not from the battle, but in the home. For most people, work is a burden. It has been estimated that more than one third of the population of the Roman Empire was in slavery during the time of Paul. Slaves were generally not treated well by their masters. 
Sometimes we feel we can justify our work habits because of lack of pay, poor conditions, etc. We need to remember that Paul was reprimanding people who were slaves, saying that the awful conditions in which they worked was no excuse for a poor work ethic. If we let a poor attitude permeate our thinking, it will affect other areas of our life. We hear a lot about the right to work. Paul is more interested in the right way to work. Paul says we're to be obedient. The word he uses is in the present tense, indicating uninterrupted obedience. As Christians, we should be the model of proper behaviour and obedience. Our obedience will help to verify our testimony about Jesus to others. We know that the submission relationship with our employer or masters do not last eternally. The people we have to deal with are not going to be the ones who judge us. That will be God. If we realise who we are really serving, then we can endure things we do not like. Paul says we're to work with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean we are to cower in fear of our bosses, although sometimes it will feel like that. Instead, it points to a great moral anxiety resulting from the thought of failure to carry out the task as God has called you. The place that we work is a field of service to the Lord. Our attitude can make or break us. Our motive is not to please people, but to please God. Paul had earlier written to the church at Colossae, Whatever you do, do it heartily, as for the Lord, rather than for men. We are to do our work as if we were doing it for Jesus himself. God has not called all to the preaching ministry or to the foreign missions field. But we can serve Jesus whether we farm or work in a factory or shop. We are motivated to do well because of our love for Jesus. God's people have, seen, have been seen as a stumbling block and a reproach. We, as the living representatives of our faith, have been reviled by the world. We stand in the way of the world. The world which desires its own way, rather than God's way, would love to see us vanish from the face of the earth. This is the conflict of the ages to which we are all a part of as Christians. It is true for Christians, the redeemed of God, those saved through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How then can we make our way in such an environment? Paul wrote these words to assure the church of its unity in Christ, its unity of purpose, and its share in the promise of Christ. Today we are still relatively free, and we are free to speak out against whatever we wish, but we see an ever-increasing move to change laws, building an attitude of fear. What are we to do in such times? How are we to react and act as Christians and citizens? We must first realise that we are not our own. We are God's chosen people purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world, just as the early church was. We are to draw all men to Jesus Christ through the message of the gospel and the power of transformed lives that have the Holy Spirit living within them. Times are changing for us us as a nation and as Christians. We see increasing attacks on the people of God and the Church of Christ. It is time to put on the armour of God that Paul explains at the end of this letter. Paul is describing the, army, uh, the armour of an average Roman soldier. For these soldiers to be effective in battle, they need to be protected on the battlefield. Let's look at that armour. 
so that we may know what we are to wear as we go into spiritual battle as a church. The belt of truth. This goes around the waist and serves to stabilise the body, as well as protecting the midsection. It refers to knowing the truth of the Bible. Jesus promised that the truth had the power to make us free. Knowing the truth will stabilise us and protect us. This reminds us that we are to walk in the truth at all times. The breastplate of righteousness. This protects the vital tender areas of the body, specifically the heart. We are declared righteous when we trust Jesus as Saviour, but we are commanded to practice righteousness as a habit of life. When we live holy, consecrated lives before the Lord, we are less prone to attacks from the devil, with our hearts being guarded and protected. The shoes of the gospel. Roman soldiers wore sandals that had nails driven through the bottom to provide soldiers with the surest of footing on the battlefield. He did not have to worry about his feet slipping in the heat of the battle because he was always well grounded. For the believer this reminds us that we are to be well grounded in the things of God and be committed to the preaching of the gospel of Christ. We are to be sure of the fundamentals of the faith, and labour for the salvation of others. We need to know what we believe and why, so that we will be on a sound foundation when the battle comes against us. Such a sure-footed stand should serve to give us peace in the battles of life. The shield of faith. This refers to the large rectangular metal shield behind which soldiers would be safe from the fiery darts of the enemy. Our shield is our faith in God, his power and his words. It is a shield that will never fail nor expose the carrier because faith allows us to stand in the battle and receive the victory regardless of the odds we face. Our faith is so important that we are told that we are to have this above all. The helmet of salvation. The helmet was given to the Roman soldiers to protect their brain, the centre of memory and the seat of judgment. Regardless of how well the other parts of the body were protected, a blow to the brain would render the entire soldier ineffective. Salvation provides the helmet that is necessary to protect our minds from the attacks of the enemy. When we are saved, we are transformed. It is this transformation that allows us to think right thoughts and wage holy war. The mind must be protected. As we fight the battles, we must never forget what the Lord did for us and in us when he saved us by his grace. The assurance of our salvation will be like a helmet protecting the mind from the devil. The sword of the spirit. This refers to the short, straight sword carried by every Roman soldier. It was very effective in hand-to-hand -hand combat and essential to the survival of the soldier. We're told that the sword is the word of God. It is the word of God that enables us to conquer the enemy in every battle we face. It is essential for the Christian soldier to be proficient in the use of this weapon by diligently studying the word and living by it at all times. The praying by the Spirit, the greatest offensive weapon we have, is the ability to call on the Lord our God when we are in the thick of battle. He is able to communicate his orders to us on the spot and we can implement them immediately. Never be guilty of neglecting the awesome power of prayer. Prayer brings you into the presence of God and it allows the Lord to work through you in a remarkable way. Prayer unleashes the power of God in the life of the believer. 
As believers in Jesus Christ, we are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. Our commander-in-chief has already won the victory. All we have to do is to get up, dress in the armour, stand up, and line up awaiting, awaiting our marching orders. He will lead us to victory. J.B. Phillips translates this passage as, In conclusion, be strong, not in yourselves, but in the Lord, in the power of his boundless resource. Put on God's complete armour so that you can successfully resist all the devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It's against organisations and powers that are spiritual. We're up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and the spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. Therefore you must wear the whole armour of God so that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power and that even when you have fought to a standstill you may still stand your ground. He concludes this section as we conclude our study with a call to prayer. Pray at all times and with every kind of spiritual prayer, keeping alert and persistent as you pray for all Christ's men and women. And pray for me too, that I may be able to speak freely here to make known the secret of the gospel for which I am, so to speak, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may speak out about it as my plain and obvious duty. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or if you're in the Redstock area one Sunday morning, want to come along and join us at the Baptist Church for our 10.30 service. You will always be very welcome.